go. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Hi. Uh, this is Joe. Joe Little. Um, uh, and we're having a webinar on what Friday, December twentieth. Thank you all for coming out on a day. Well, many of us, many of us think it is the day before Christmas because it's the Friday before Christmas. But anyway, on a on a day in the in the holidays um, and a Friday to boot. Um, okay, so we wanted to talk about a book that I'm very excited about. Let me start to play the, the slide deck and move this around a little bit. Oh, my goodness, I've got to do this to do this, apparently. And maybe to do that as well. That needs to move around also. Okay, so um, so the the book that I'm uh, that I really like, um, that I'm trying to, you know, I've been reading it, so to speak, as scrumplop.org uh, over a bunch of years now. It's been curated by Jeff Sutherland and James Copelian uh, for a bunch of years. And now they've taken that website, which I still recommend uh, as a reference and easy to carry around, so to speak, because it's in your browser. Um, but they've take that, taken that and put it into a book called A Scrum Book. Uh, and it has a whole bunch of patterns. Uh, so that leads me to my first, uh, first slide. So some of you may be familiar with the patterns movement. Um, so they're using the, the ideas from the patterns movement. The patterns movement comes from um, a guy, an architect named Christopher Alexander, who a long time ago initially came up with a book called A Timeless Way of Building. He's an architect. So A Timeless Way of Building is, is the way he was thinking about it. That's the title he gave to his book. Um, and he started talking a little bit, I think, then about patterns. Uh, and you may want to read about patterns in Wikipedia and so forth. But anyway, later he wrote a book called A Pattern Language um, with the idea that there could be many pattern languages. And his pattern language was about architecture or building things, you might say. Uh, and a lot of people liked it. A lot of people read it, particularly people in, I'll call it our industry of, of technology, of software development, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, technology is bigger than software development, but particularly in, in the software, I call it the software development industry, and, and then particularly by people that later became uh, what we know as agile people or agilists or whatever we want to call them. Uh, so it's, fair, it's not uh, universally popular amongst the agile people, but it's a very popular idea amongst a lot of the senior agile people and influenced them uh, uh, from the start, you might say, of of what we think of as agile. Anyway, so what is a pattern? A pattern is a is an idea of how to do things, uh, how to how to do a process, or how to build software, or how to build a building, or how to architect a city. But it's a it's an idea of of a short idea, a simple idea, relatively speaking, um, of how to do things, and they want to express it in a relatively concise form, um, typically a page or two or three or something like that. Uh, it has a certain format. I won't even go into that, but it does have a format. At least some people think it does. Um, but they want to express it relatively quickly, as you see there. And the idea is it's a pattern that I think works well, that I've usually used, the writer, this is the writer speaking, that I've usually used many times. Uh, and I think it might work for you. But, you know, things are different for you. Good luck. Your mileage may vary. But at least I think you might want to know about it. It is... So it does not have the idea of a confirmed, quote unquote, best practice, and that you should use it uh, under almost any conditions. It doesn't have that idea, uh, which I think the concept of best practices typically does. Depends on who you're talking to. Some, you know, if you ask them, they'll say, "Well, well, well, no, of course I don't know that it's going to work for you," uh, and so they'll back off. But typically, it has that connotation: the idea of best practice. So anyway, a pattern is an option to consider. And that is the approach that, that Sutherland Copley and, and actually a wider group uh, of folks that worked on the, the scrum plop patterns, uh, pattern language of programming is plop, that's what plop stands for. Um, uh, that is the idea that, that the, those folks had. And they came up with a whole bunch of patterns. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if, I didn't check to see if all of them from scrum plop are documented in the scrum book, but it's a lot. Uh, they have a lot of patterns there. Okay, so the first pattern that I want to talk about is the number one pattern that they put in the book. So the idea is the spirit of the game. That's the title of the pattern. Um, so the first thing to me that I think is awfully important is the pattern that Scrum is a game with simple rules that, as you might say, a six-year-old could understand. 
Uh, and to me, as soon as you say it's a game, that has many other implications. Uh, it seems so simple to say, it's only a four letter word, but it starts to ripple through in lots of ways. For example, a game almost always implies, uh, well, it depends on what, there's to me two kinds of games. There's games with individual players and there's games with teams. Uh, so to me, it implies the team thing very quickly. Anyway, the spirit of the game. So the idea that they talk about in the in the book is that uh, I think cricket. They they give a picture of the cricket book and they talk about the spirit of the game. So you don't just follow the rules. You have to also follow the spirit of the game. The rule, the sort of called you might say unspoken rules. And so when push comes to shove, the, the referees and the players are supposed to follow the spirit of the game. So there is some sort of an idea that Scrum is, there's something in addition to Scrum over and above the rules that are described in the 18 pages of the Scrum Guide. Um, and then there's the idea that they just go on to describe in that section that there's a helpful culture that's a supportive culture uh, around Scrum uh, or around whatever game you're playing that uh, and then so you have to sort of figure out what that is that culture of that spirit and then and then play the game or or you might say enforce the rules in accordance with that spirit uh, another key idea is that the scrum framework does not uh, provide all the answers maybe it cannot uh, maybe it chooses not to you could argue about it, those kinds of things uh, but in any case it does not provide all the rules particularly in the 18 pages, but in any case. And then you have to provide additional answers for your team in terms of how you play the game, which is a little bit different thing uh, than the spirit of the game idea, but that's a key concept that they've talked about in that section. So to me, that's an uh, awfully important, good thing to start with. Number 40 is one of my favorites. Um, so in the Scrum Guide, there's mention of impediments. There's, I think, I haven't double checked today, but I think there's no mention of impediment list. But pattern number 40, it says impediment list. So, and I go a little bit further. I want it to be the top 20 as you see at the bottom. But anyway, you make a list of the impediments and the impediments are broadly defined. Anything that, um, well, I'm not sure if I'm quoting from the book now, but I'm gonna say this. Anything that's slowing down the team or stopping the team, but particularly slowing down the team in a significant way, and another way I might put it is anything we want to improve on. So we can express it as an opportunity for improvement or we can express it as an impediment, but it's essentially the same thing or the other side of the coin, if you, if you prefer. Uh, and the next thing is we prioritize them on some reasonable basis. I'm gonna say benefit over cost mainly, maybe some dependencies and so forth, but benefit over cost. Um, and, and then we work on them one by one. They also have that pattern uh, in the book, um, one thing at a time or something like that, it's called. Um, we work on them in priority order one at a time. And over time, we expect to give this, you might say, a bigger benefit than just the benefit of the individual things. That is to say, the, the, the whole benefit is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, then the idea that anyone can add to the impediment list. Where, okay. Not, anyone off of trade and try on, but, but anyone that's reasonable. Um, they also mentioned the idea that managers can help. Uh, not that managers are gonna solve all of our problems for us, but that managers amongst others can help get these impediments removed. Um, and I'm gonna add the idea that they, to me, didn't make clear enough that people outside the team can help. Typically, usually only after the managers uh, agree to that. Uh, I'm assuming that people outside the team want to get some compensation or whatever benefit from helping us. Um, sometimes they'll do it out of the goodness of their hearts. Or we can read a book uh, for relatively, you know, almost negligible money from the library, for example. Um, so there are other ways of getting help than just by having somebody, you might call it, consult with us. But if they're going to consult with us and take, you know, reasonably significant time to help us with the payments, you would think typically they want compensation. Therefore, the managers have to approve that typically in most organizations. Uh, anyway, I mentioned the top 20. We've got that, that little list. So I really like that one. That's one of my faves. Um, I put that on my five, excuse me, yes, five boxes of artifacts, the impediment list. The happiness metric. This one is a little, seems to be a little bit uh, controversial even amongst them. But you should be aware that Jeff Sullen has spoken many times at Scrum Inc. on his blog 
scrumming.com about the happiness metric. And I, there are two quotes that he's, that I've heard him say. Uh, so to me, they're quotes, two things I've heard him say that, uh, to, at least to me, he says quite frequently, I think that's still the case. One is that if you're not having more fun, you're not doing scrum, right? And the other is fun is essential. Um, and then maybe there are a lot of reasons behind that. Now, in as I say here in the in the Scrum book, there's a depressingly long <laughs> discussion of happiness. I mean, why does happiness have to be talked about so so long? Just go out and you know, happiness. If you like it, go be happy. Um, and I think, uh, well, I'll I'll come to that later. So the one of the key ideas is an idea that you may have heard about from uh, Daniel Pink: the idea of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So at least in that discussion, they bring up the idea of purpose. Um, and then I want to read you something that may not sound like happiness to you, but I used to live in New York City near the Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt statue outside the Museum of American History. Here's a quote, a pretty, pretty famous quote from Theodore Roosevelt about the man in the arena, which they talk about in this section, in this, uh, in this pattern. So as I say, a whole bunch of pages. I think the biggest one of all in terms of pages. Here's the quote. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes, uh, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Hmm, well, it's very, I mean, if you know Theodore Roosevelt, it's kind of his idea, his personality. Um, but anyway, they they have that idea that that there's happiness in, in trying to achieve things, even if we make mistakes and fail sometimes. Um, there's some Michael Jordan quotes. There's some lots of other quotes in this area. Uh, so some of us may not think of happiness quite that way, but they're talking about it that way. Um, my idea is that there's a happiness in being with a team that wants to win together. And even if they don't, you know, even if they don't win the Super Bowl, at least they became a better team than they thought they could. Uh, and there's a lot of, I think, satisfaction, we might call it, or, or, or sense of achievement, um, pride, those kinds of words, in, in doing that together, or at least trying to do that together, and, and having some degree of success at least. Now, a key thing we have to say here, somewhere along the line, is we have to have sustainable pace. And uh, at least in my opinion, a lot of people in our industry are determined <laughs> not to have happiness and just to work themselves to death. Um, so between, and some of, us, some of us blame it on the managers or the culture of the company or whatever, but it's also within a lot of us, I think. A lot of us, I'll call us, I'll call us right now the workers. Um, and we don't help ourselves have sustainable pace and then we're easily beguiled into thinking we can blame others for the fact that we're working way too many hours uh, each week. So anyway, sustainable pace has got to be in there, but it's not by any means the whole thing. Um, I think uh, as you as we talked about purpose, uh, somewhere is the sense that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Perhaps this time of the year we can maybe understand that more readily and easily um, if we're parents and we give things for to our kids. Uh, that's certainly very satisfying as parents, but but even to customers or or to others, that can give us a sense of maybe we might call it fulfillment. Um, anyway, so why the long discussion? Uh, I mean, you, you should go read it yourself. But my short answer to at least to start to think about it is maybe we've got a bunch of you know northern Europeans who are just uncomfortable with emotions, um, and happiness is at least it seems to them too much of an emotion. And, and possibly, at least sometimes, uh, and I think this is fair, it can be a somewhat misleading emotion. Um, and, and to certain people, you know, it seems like that Pharrell Williams thing, when in fact, maybe it's a little bit closer to the Theodore Roosevelt thing. Uh, so anyway, you might want to read the discussion. It's, a, it's interesting. But maybe even forget about all that. I think you want your team, whatever you really mean by that, you want your team to have more fun and to be happier. I think I see that almost every time. 
Um, okay, stable teams. This is a very important uh, pattern. Jeff Sullivan has talked about it often as one of the key patterns. So by stable, he first assumes that the team is dedicated, of course, uh, but also reliable. But the key thing about stable is that they stay together. And then they go through, you know, different things, but uh, things together, you might say, but one of them would be the forming, storming, norming, performing thing. But they become reliable. They gain a sense of consistency, predictability. And I'm going to add this, that it starts to feel to the team members kind of like a home. Um, and, and I'll go a little bit further in that last quote there, that it becomes sort of magical. Uh, but this all can only happen if they stay together for some good period of time. Uh, they, 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 we, the community doesn't define what that period of time is. I think that life happens and that period of time is not going to be, you know, three decades. Uh, that's not really what human beings can do. Um, but it certainly can be well more than a year uh, and maybe several years. But anyway, the quote at the bottom and this is now Joe's, Joe trying to, or me trying to express the magic of a team. A uh, quote from Shakespeare. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. And somehow magically the team is, as we sometimes say, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, but it starts, or at least one of the key patterns around that is stable team. Okay, now something that, this is something that I'm adding that they didn't quite say. So I tease, and I don't know if you know, of there's a Beatles song, that's the one after 909. Um, so I give it that title. They have a lot of patterns, so I'm teasing about how many patterns they have also. Um, but the idea, you know, first let's start with the team. It's a team that wants to win together. Uh, they want to be together. They want to win together. Um, so it's not just a sort of friendliness thing that we want to be together and sip tea or or drink wine or you know, uh, have a, another IPA or whatever, but that we want to win together. So this leads me to suggest at least, and I think others suggest this also, that you want to choose your team. Each person should be choosing their team within reason. And they shouldn't just choose the team because everybody, they like everybody. They should choose the team that they want to win with, which makes it kind of interesting, doesn't it? Um, um, and then you do what you can to help your team win. Uh, sometimes we say, particularly I think if this is a Canadian expression, we, we together are going to figure it out and, and make it happen. Um, and then to me, another related axiom um, is the idea that you have to trust the team. Maybe I'm mainly or partly at least referring to the idea of the magic of the team. Um, and then the idea, so this is, uh, you know, we go back to the very first one talked about the spirit of the game. Here we're talking about the team spirit, maybe. So anyway, if they start to come together, one can say not only about individually, as Henry David Thoreau said uh, in, in Walden, living by himself, um, but we can say this also about the team, that they can go confidently in the direction of their dreams and live the life that they imagined. As you simplify your life, the laws of the universe will be simpler. So I wanted to make, give you the four quote uh, from, from Walden. This is on the next page here. Um, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams, this is Henry David Thoreau talking some years ago, some decades ago, and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. In proportion, as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex. And solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty, poverty, nor weakness. weakness. I kind of like this quote, vis-a-vis uh, -vis or in, you know, in relation to, to Agile. Um, okay, so we did a few. We talk, I, I talked too much. Now, why don't we talk a little bit more? So are there, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the book, to look at Scrum Plop. Um, uh, and maybe I've got a... Maybe you've got to help unmute yourself, but um, are there any patterns that, that you wanted to mention that you saw in the book um, or have seen or heard about before? Which of you is going to go first? You can, you can do it on the, um, on the chat if you want to, if you feel shy. But there's only a few of us here, so don't feel shy. There's nothing to feel, feel shy about. 
So I, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. This is about a course. So, yes. Uh, so I have the book, but I haven't had a chance to uh, really dig into it yet. It's you know, on my reading list, and that's why I was kind of interested in this webinar. Yes, yes. So, so you can open it up quickly. You can open it up quickly and see uh, the in the table of contents. They do number one. They got 17 on the first page, up to 50 on the second page, 88, and then 94. <laughs> or it depends on how you count it, but 94 on the last page. Um, you see in the first part of the list, some of the basic things about Scrum, right? So Scrum team, involve the managers, co-located team. So some, I mean, you'll read these, I think, uh, Matt, and you'll find that they're different than what you thought Scrum was. And at least the very basic ones, you know, um, development, having a development team, autonomous team, self-organizing team. Um, those kinds of things. Scrum Master. Uh, I'm looking for the product owner, but I don't see it right now. Anyway, daily Scrum, some of the meetings and so forth. You look at them and go like, I thought I understood these. And then you read these patterns and you go like, hmm, this is helping me see. So there's some a lot of very basic patterns. At least we thought they were very basic. Um, and then you start to see others and you go like, hmm. So a lot of these we could think of as adding to the team, being added to the team later. One, maybe one at a time, one pattern at a time. We try to get the team, if we're the scrum master, the agile advocate, the agile coach, uh, pretty much anybody really, but particularly you would think the scrum master might take these and talk to the team about them. Um, so as you look at them, anything that strikes you? I, uh, the, the one way that they might strike you is you might realize, you know, we need to help with this. So one, I was doing a course, the, uh, the about a day ago, two days uh, this week. And the idea that the uh, number 57, that the pigs estimate, seemed a bit of a stretch for, for some of them. They, they, they thought they were doing Scrum, but now I was saying the, you know, the, the five doers actually do the estimating. And they were going, oh, it's a little bit different than what we're doing currently. So anyway, there's, you'll find some that you go like, hmm, this is a challenge for my culture, for my team. Okay, Katie, any that are appealing to you? Um, uh, I have not read the book. I don't even have it yet, Joe. I apologize, okay. but oh, no, no, no worries. Yet. No worries. I was hoping that you might have, and I should have warned you to, or, or asked you to take a few minutes and look at Scrum Plop. The book is expensive, to be honest. I don't know how much it is, but it's, it's, I remember it's expensive. $64, you, $65 US. Wow. At least the cover, the cover price. Um, and, but most of the stuff is on Scrum Plop for free. Uh, scrumplop.org for free. So I should have, so that's my fault. I should have warned you to, or, you know, suggested that you take a quick look at least and, and read one or two to get a flavor for these things. Um, okay, so let me ask you a different question on the next slide. Um, well, first of all, do you have any questions about what I said? Anything intriguing that you want to talk about a little bit more? Uh, Nothing here. Uh, yes, Katie. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, I'm heading into my first uh, Scrum Master role beginning January 2nd. Ah, okay. So very good. I'll have more as we go forward. <laughs> yes, very good. So a lot of the basic, I mean, you'll see, you read the Scrum Guide. So one suggestion, you read the Scrum Guide, go get, well, I would get, you know, it's expensive, get your company to pay for the darn book, but get the book. Uh, quickly, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, do, do it on Amazon right away and then you have it and then you just expense it to the company, but whatever you got, got to do, uh, get the book or read it on, you know, scrumplop.org and, and you'll see a, a bunch of these patterns. Well, let's see. Um, that are exactly the same thing that's been mentioned in the scrum guide. So you can get into them in more depth and go like, Hmm. Uh, so yesterday's weather is kind of mentioned. Uh, sprint goal is mentioned. Sprint backlog seventy two. Sprint uh, backlog item seventy three. I mean, there's all through here. There are things that are basic that are in the Scrum Guide, and here you'll see more information, more ideas about uh, not only what it is and how to do it, but also why do we want to do it. And sometimes your teammates, your your the team that you're working with, will push back. And if you explain why you want them to do things, which this does more and you know in more depth than one thing at a time then they're more likely to do it. Now, they may not agree with the explanation. That's a different thing, but at least they have one. 
and they have more than the, I mean, there's a little bit of stuff in the scrum guide, as you may recall, but it's, I mean, man, boom, boom, boom. It's very quick. So that little suggestion to you. Um, okay. Any questions, Matt, for you? Um, not about the book, but the one item. Or, or anything that we've talked about so far. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So the one thing that I, I did have a question about, not so much, um, about the book itself, but uh, you mentioned the happiness happiness metric. Yes. How, how do people tend to judge that? Because that is one of the most like difficult, intangible type of metrics to really judge. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so different people do it different ways. Uh, you'll see that he talks that the book talks about what you know a little bit about what Henry does, a little bit about what Jeff does. So in a practical way, I think I would recommend going to scruminc.com and, you know, searching for happiness metric. And they'll tell you, as I recall, they do it. I mean, I think that they still say this. That's why I say, as I recall. Uh, so they might have changed. Um, the, the, the write-up in the book is different, little, somewhat different than I expected because I expected it to be more like what I had read on scruminc.com. Uh, but anyway, over there, they're talking about, you know, one to five scale, every sprint we ask them. Uh, where are you on the scale? They don't worry, and they also ask them, you know, why? Or, you know, what's the biggest thing that we can do to make you happier? They want some sort of, um, you know, not just a number, but also some sort of feedback. And and then the idea is we want the, the it, it to be going up. Uh, Henrik talks about how often the team sort of stabilizes at a pretty good number, but not a perfect number. Um, in other words, not five but they're stabilized at 4.1 or something like that. And you know, they bounce around a little bit around there, but it stays there, which is not usually that interesting that it stays somewhere. It's when it goes up or goes down that you go like, oh, that's, inf that's interesting information. But anyway, you, you, the idea is that you keep track of it and you, over time, want them to become happier and you more or less, one way or the other, ask them, well, let's say it starts out low. You know, they, they, they don't have much morale as an example, as simplistically. So then you say, well, what do you think would help the happiness go up? Uh, and they start giving you what you could think of in a certain way, at least as impediments. Now you might ask yourself, do I deal with the happiness related impediments, which are usually underlying, rather important, or do I deal with the more practical impediments like you know, the server fell over, or we don't have enough automated testing or things of that nature. Uh, so you, you might want to pick and choose. Uh, it's, you know, human beings are complex. Sometimes if you fix one thing, other things start to get better. Um, I've done things like this. Uh, I haven't done the happiness metric myself as much as I would like. I, I learned about it later and I haven't spent, you know, I haven't been a, a, a direct team coach or a, uh, for a long period of time or a scrum master uh, when I learned about this. So I haven't played with it as much, and I, but I've talked to people about it. So, uh, but anyway, you, you, you want to use it to learn things and then start to change things. Uh, but the the happiness tends to go up when they start to have more confidence that they're going to get it done and they're going to be successful. So I like to track that. I like to ask them, you know, how do you like Agile? How do you like this uh, our likelihood of success? And then I would add how you know how happy on a scale of one to five, how happy are you? And then get the comments. So anyway, learn, you can learn more about the practical aspects of it uh, at Scrum Inc. Uh, I think he says it rather well. Uh, he Jeff Sullen. So I think. It may be that his discussion of it, because his blog posts are somewhat shorter and he's a business guy, he's pretty straightforward to the point. Um, they can be convincing. Your culture might be tough. I mean, we don't know. I don't, you haven't said what culture you're coming from, what kind of company you're coming from. But some cultures, they don't really believe in happiness. I, I tease and you know, go the opposite extreme and say their culture is the beatings will continue until the morale improves. Um, and, and some of them, you know, some of us are kind of there sometimes, um, or at least more that way than the, than the, I don't know if you've heard of a book called Joy Inc. I believe that's the name of it. Um, uh, I think that influenced Jeff, by the way. Uh, but it's the idea that by having, you know, people and, and companies that are more focused on joy, I'm not sure if that's my favorite word for it, but, uh, that you're going to be more successful. That's the basic idea of the book. So you, you might want to use that. There's certainly you know, studies and evidence that you can see in different places, Harvard Business Review and so forth, that'll support this idea. I think that's what you're looking for. 
what's going to support the idea. Am I right? As you try to explain it. Am I understanding you correctly, Matt? Yes. Yes, okay. And, and I do think you're right to say that some cultures find this weird. Like, you know, we're here to do work. We're not here to be, it's called work for a reason. You're not expected to be happy. And they discuss that in, in the Scrum book. So you'll want to, you know, you'll be interested in that discussion. <coughs> From your point of view, I think that discussion is useful for you and you can use bits and pieces of it, but using the whole discussion to influence people, I think is going to be tough. It's just too wordy. Uh, so I'm not particularly recommending that, but it may help you think through things and then you can synthesize that and use bits and pieces of it uh, as you discuss it with people. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Of the ones that we mentioned, so here's the last question. Um, which one do you want to take action on? So this may be a little bit hard for Katie. Katie's just getting a team started. Right. I don't even know my teammates' names yet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so actually, I, so let me suggest one to you then. Well, uh, this can, I'll give you a chance to answer the question. Is there one that you think you might want to get started of, of the ones that we mentioned? Is there one that you want to work on for, you know, earlier? Is anything appealing to you? Not particularly. It sounds like. The stable team is the one that, uh, ah. and the spirit. I mean, I, yeah. Those two. Okay. And I'm going to suggest a more practical one, I think. Um, so talking about having a stable team, I mean, you're just beginning, right? So talking about it from the get-go will help make it at least more stable. Right. Most organizations are, I mean, they may to agree and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all they, they seem to, all they do is try to make sure that they tear your team apart as soon as possible. Yeah. Honest to God, that's right. the action. I mean, maybe you've seen that already, so it's obvious to you, but I see that that's a lot. Like, yeah. uh, so, but anyway, here's a practical one, the, the impediment list. Ask ah. the even before you get your team doing the first sprint, have them list out what they think are the impediments. And then oh, enable good. And then enable them, and, not, and don't get more than twenty. Uh, you know, twenty is twenty is too many, really. But anyway, get you know, get them roughly twenty, something like that. Let's prioritize them, and then, you know, they'll say, uh, "Well, I'm not going to use that word. It's Christmas time." They'll say, "Wow, I'm surprised." But then you work on the top one, even though you may not agree this is the top one. You work on the top one, and you you know, you get it at least partially fixed, and they go, "Dang, that never happened before." Well, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. But you know what I mean? They're not used to seeing people ask for the impediments and then start working on them right away. I don't think they're used to seeing that that much. Am I right? Right. It sometimes Absolutely. happens. It sometimes happens, but it's but it's often very. They think of it as very uncommon. Managers are trying mm -hmm. to do. Managers are trying to do that in the background, at least commonly, but they don't necessarily make it very clear that they're doing so. Um, mm -hmm. And often we don't. We don't. They don't make it clear that they did it, and that and they don't help us make it clear that we got the benefits of it. Um, and they often do one that we didn't think was important. We, the team, I mean, the team members. So we're we're trying to change that dynamic. Now, I'm okay if you try to influence them some, that this one's more important than that one, or this one will be easier, and therefore the cost benefit of that one will be better to do that one first. So you can influence them some, but I wouldn't argue with them too much. Let them tell you the biggest one, and then you try to work on it. And you're, I'm making you the scrum master. Is that correct? That, yes, that's correct. I yep. think you may have said that even. I'm sorry. I apologize if I don't didn't remember. Uh, but I think, this, okay. I think this impediment list can be very practical. Does that make sense to you, Matt? It. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I actually, I actually track that already. Oh, awesome. So, yeah, we, we track our impediments on the team that, or on the teams that I'm currently on. Uh, oh, you're going in and out, Matt. Uh, sometimes I can hear you well, and other times not so much. How about now? Uh, now, now, no. Before it was really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably just there, my headset. There. Yeah, that's that's good. Maybe you're moving uh, the your position of your head vis a vis the mic. Um, but uh, okay, so you're already doing it, and you have it prioritized. Uh, yes, we usually good. whatever the most recent one is, is t tends to be the number one. That, okay. that what's at what's front and center is usually what people want to address. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so you might want to read about it more, um, and that may make it even better. Um, uh, okay, very good. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. I think we've used up our half an hour, but uh, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I will, we'll, we'll follow up and, and uh, post the slide deck, such as it is. It's not 
not very much, but we'll post a slide deck so you can use that if you'd like to, or at least have it. Uh, and we'll also, uh, I think, if we can save this file, maybe clean it a little bit, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, audio file, um, and uh, along with the, the video uh, some, and post it on YouTube. So if you were, if you wanted to show it to somebody else, you can do that. Uh, we'll also be doing more of these, one a month. Um, and I'd be interested in your ideas about what you'd like me to cover. So here's the subject I'm planning to cover, which is, should the Scrum Master be full-time? So that was just a question that was raised on LinkedIn by some relatively experienced people. Um, and I think that's a somewhat, at least to me, that's a question that we haven't, that we, we don't have as much agreement on the right answer as we should. Uh, of course, there are many situations, but anyway. So anyway, I'm going to start talking about that. Um, my basic bias is it should be a full-time job and also a long-term job. There was a, there's also the question of, doesn't the Scrum Master go away eventually? Uh, so I think it's a full-time job and a long-term job. Uh, and I use So I'm going to talk about it next time. Uh, and also uh, maybe talk about, well, how do we, you know, how do you convince more people that that should be so? To me, that's a little bit different topic. So I think I'm going to end up doing the next two sessions on you know, different, I'll call it the two halves of that topic. I'm, uh, but I'd certainly be interested in your topics that you might be interested in, and, and we'll try to cover those uh, over the coming months. Anyway, thanks so much. Um, I'll sign up for, for now. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, um, and hope to talk to you later. Cheers Same to you, Joe, and thanks so much. You're quite thanks, welcome. Joe. You're quite welcome. Cheers. Bye-bye.